Greetings, greetings. Good afternoon in the UK here. Good morning in the US. Good evening if you're viewing from other parts of the world. My name is Eli Wananda and this is We Are Reading. We Are Reading is a series of an ongoing series of live stream discussions where we read books written predominantly by African authors and where we uh, go through where we analyze, we understand, we interpret uh, the ideas and the concepts that these uh, these esteemed brothers and sisters of ours, ancestors in the main, but also elders and youngsters, we go through the ideas that they're sharing with us, and hopefully we we purloin or we get some we get some nourishment for our day to day lives, but also for our collective lives as African people in this world today. So. We're doing it at a slightly different time today for a change. We're doing it at, in a well, different day, Monday afternoon, and we're doing it, uh, yeah, like I say, one o'clock UK time, early in the morning US time. So let's get into it. I'm at work, so this is a this is a lunchtime session that I'm going to do. Uh, we're going to get into this book right now, Blueprint for Black Power, Baba Amos Wilson, and we're going to get straight into chapter 11 chapter 11 please please make sure you you like the video and do share if you would as well chapter 11 is called ideology and the legitimization of dominance so baba Ewa Swanson has talked a lot already in this book about how the ruling elites the white male uh, elites Particularly in the United States, but also in the rest of the rest of the world, really, use ideas, symbols, uh, concepts to legitimize their power. And these these ideas, these 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 psychic psychological games that they play, are very very important because it's very costly, physically costly, financially costly, militarily costly, economically costly to keep using guns and bombs and whatnot. So, for example, right now. Uh, the, the Zionist state can't wouldn't be able to keep on doing what it's doing now uh, against the Palestinians. It wouldn't be able to keep doing this forever and ever and ever. They they will have to cease fire soon because it you know they're not it's not a bottomless pit of money. They can't keep using the guns and bombs and so forth. They always have it there as a threat, of course, to use. But generally speaking, it's much cheaper and much more much more effective to get into the minds of the oppressed and to to convince them that their oppressed condition is natural is normal and to to not bother fighting back and and that sort of stuff so that's that's a that's a really strong central theme that runs through blueprint for black power by baba amos wilson so uh, like i said this chapter uh, is going to clearly going to go into that into some detail so shout out to you Lao Tzu. i'm so glad you can make it my brother I know moving it to a different time is, is just awkward, but uh, grand rising to you. His message here, as usual, uh, very empowering and uh, inspiring. He says, grand rising, beautiful ebony people, 19th of February, 532 of the Ma'afa. So he says, it's president day here. And a certain section of the population is on vacation. Not one of those, however, preparing for work. Oh, I see, I see. Okay, so it's, so it's a, a holiday, a public, we call those bank holidays in the UK. So, all right, pres I I've never heard of President's Day, actually. So, you go, you have President's Day. Uh, anyway, there we go. All right, let's get into this. Uh, let's get into this reading then. So, Chapter Eleven of Blueprint for Black Power, Page Two Two Zero: Ideology and the Legitimization of Dominance. Let's read. In our second chapter, we discussed a number of sources or bases of power. For example, economic resources, authority, class membership, family, culture, organization, and the like. However, a source of power more fundamental than these, in fact, the ultimate base of power for the other power sources, is that of the power of ideas. The power of mind, of thought, imagination and vision, the power of symbols and the word, the power of ideation and the translation of ideation into action are manifested in a multiple of personal, social, cultural and physical forms. For ideas are actualized and incarnated in patterns of social attitudes, 
relations and organization in social and physical project products in abilities and inabilities superordinations and subordinations knowledge is idea the product of ideation reciprocally interacting with not with reality therefore if knowledge is power ideas have power ideas can be coercive and compelling Beliefs, symbols, doctrines, and idea systems can enable or empower men through their capacity to induce them into states of consciousness conducive to the achievement of certain personal and social goals which would not be achievable by other means. Indeed, as Thomas Dye asserts, whole societies are shaped by systems of ideas that we frequently refer to as ideologies. He goes on to define an ideology as, quote, an integrated system of ideas that provides society and its members with rational, rationalizations for a way of life, guides for evaluating rightness and wrongness, and emotional impulses to action, unquote. Page 221. The relationship between socio-economic power and social ideology is an intimate one. For Ideology legitimates power systems, hierarchical structures, and social relations through its provision of rationales and justifications for the exercise of power and the necessity of certain social relations. If ideology successfully justifies the distribution and exercise of power within social relations, then it represents itself as a potent source of control over the consciousness and behavior of the participants. All very uncontroversial. This is pretty much just re rehashing things that Baba Amos Wilson has already said. Said, but some of you might be watching this, and some of you might be this. This might be new to some of you. The idea that ideology is so powerful that ideology actually is the foundational form of power before uh, that holds up all the other forms of power. That ideology is what holds up uh, military power, political power, economic power social power and all that sort of stuff if the ideas if you don't have if you if you don't have ideological dominance over somebody or some group of people then you're not going to be able to translate you're going to have nothing to translate into actual physical political military power if that makes sense so it really does matter what you think and why you think what you think what you have to always be thinking where did these ideas come from about family what, why do I think the way I do about family? What what do I think about family? Where did it come from? Does it serve my interests as an individual? Does it serve my interests as a collective? For those of you who are African-centered, black conscious people, we should always be thinking, do these ideas that we have about uh, family or, or what, whatever, class, career, job, you know, whatever it might be, do these ideas serve our interests as black people or do they serve somebody else's interests? And if you're not thinking on those lines, you can't call yourself conscious, in my humble opinion. You must always be thinking on those lines. And it is, it's heavy work. It's heavy work. It is kind of overbearing at times, constantly to be thinking like this, because once you start to do this, religious people will, will kind of get this point as well. Once you start to realize that the way that we think about everything is basically concocted and is not natural, but is given to us, then you start to see all around you how it's being done. You, you start to see all around you how, how the powers that be and culture, society is trying to shape how you think. And then, it, you know, then you're like, oh my God, there's a lot to keep having to fight against or unpack, but this is the way, <laughs> as, uh, as Boba, uh, as, as the Mandalorian would say in Star Wars, this is the way, the conscious way. All right, back to the book, page 221 again. So this is a quote from Thomas Dye, and it goes as follows. Ideologies control people's behavior in several ways. One, ideologies affect perception. Ideologies influence what people see in the world around them. Ideologies frequently describe the power of human beings in society. They help us become aware of certain aspects of society, but often impair our ability or reduce our ability to see other aspects. 
Ideologies may distort and oversimplify in their effort to provide a unified, coherent account of society. That's a very important point because, again, going back to religion, this is one of the things that you, you can have in the religious mindset where you view everything, for example, through the prism of sin and uh, not sin. Is this a sin? Is this behavior a sin or is it not a sin? And, you know, that's a very, very simplistic view of the world, isn't it? Something is either good or bad. It depends. A lot of the time, it depends. There's a lot more nuance involved in these things. You want to say, oh, these people are of my religion. They're good people. These people are of this other religion. They're bad people. These people call the most, you know, call the, call the divine this name. Those people call the divine that name. They're bad. We're good. They're bad. You know, very simplistic mindset. And of course, you run away from things which you've been told to run away from and thus you can't learn from these other ideas, these other people and so on. So I'd certainly get that ideology can really narrow your, your perception of things. And a book that really can't, two, two of the books that we've studied in this series that really get into that are The Invention of Women by Oyoronke Oyowumi. Really good book talking about how the Yoruba conception of male and female was very unlike the Western British Western conception of male and female. And then Urugu as well by Mama Marimba Arni went into extensive detail in, into, into that kind of thing as well. So that's good. All right. Number two, ideologies rationalize and justify a way of life and hence provide legitimacy for the structure of society. An ideology may satisfy the status quo or it may provide a rationale for change or even for revolution. Okay, yep. Yeah. Number three, ideologies provide normative standards to determine rightness and wrongness in the affairs of society. Ideologies generally have a strong moral component. Occasionally, they even function as religions, complete with prophets, and in brackets, marks, scriptures, the Communist Manifesto, saints, Lenin, Stalin, Mao, and visions of utopia, communist society. Uh, communist society. <laughs> So that's good. I like that because, you know, us political types, we can very much fall into religious thinking, you know, and it's not necessarily a bad thing, but I suppose it's just to show that we're, we're not that different in a lot of ways from our more overtly religious uh, brothers and sisters. It's just that we denigrate them because we don't, we might not necessarily have a God figure in ours, or we might not necessarily appeal to the supernatural. We might just appeal to materialist material matters. But you still have this same kind of phenomenology of, of, of religion which with, with a, a particular special book, a concept of the perfect future, uh, great figures who we revere and, 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 and so on. And then, uh, yeah, prophets and so forth. Ideologies provide motivation for social and political action. They give their followers a motive to act to improve world conditions. Ideologies can convert individuals to a particular social or political movement and arouse them to action. Really good. I really like that quote from Thomas Dye. Uh, in the context of this chapter, we will speak of ideology in terms of it's used by the, by the ruling class or dominant groups to justify the existing social order. In this sense, we, re we follow Jeffrey Raymond in 1990 in asserting that, quote, when ideas, however unintentionally, distort reality in a way that justifies the prevailing distribution of power and wealth, hides society's injustices, and thus secures uncritical allegiance to the existing social order, we have what Marx called ideology. So to the naive but acute observer of the American political and economic system, it is amazingly baffling, baffling that in the face of gross and rapidly increasing inequalities in wealth and power, social status and influence, social health and welfare, the vast majority of the population who bear the burden of these inequalities do not utilize their vaunted freedom of speech and assembly to engage in fundamentally questioning the political, economic, legal institutions of the system and organize to transform them so they produce more equitable and salut salut 
electory outcomes on page 222. So people who are, people who watch politics closely might be shocked. Like, why aren't the masses rising up? They're confused. I, why are they not rising up? And Baba Amos says this, the fact that this system has not been transformed towards such outcomes implies that despite its gross inequalities and inadequacies, a critical mass of, of the population must accept the ideology used to rationalize and justify its existence. Obviously, those most interested and active in inculcating and sustaining such an ideology would be those who are the chief beneficiaries of the socioeconomic status and those who believe they stand to gain in the future from its continuance and or fear losing what they have, though it may be less than they need if the system were to be reconstituted. It should be apparent that in such a system, the rich and powerful have an especially strong interest in promulgating and elaborating the prevailing ideology which legitimates their socioeconomic status. The rich and powerful in this context of all the groups which compose American society have the greatest need for ideology and to see that the other groups are well indoctrinated in it. And there's a big, big long quote here from Ryman from a book called The Rich Get Richer and the Poor Get Prison, Ideology, Class and Criminal Justice. A simple and pervasive, persuasive argument can be made for the claim that the rich and powerful in America have an interest in conveying an ideological message to the rest of the nation. The have-nots and the have-littles far outnumber the have-plenties. This means, to put it rather crudely, the have-nots and have-littles could have more <laughs> if they decided to take it from the have-plenties. This in turn, remember that film Have Plenty for the 90s, by the way, Have Plenty? Anyway, this means that to put it, sorry, this in turn means that the have plenties need the cooperation of the have nots and the have littles. Because the have plenties are such a small minority that they can never force this cooperation on the have nots and have littles, this cooperation must be voluntary. And that's an important point there because the rich and the powerful are not the ones who are in the rich and powerful uh, arm. The army is controlled by the rich and powerful. They don't. They're not even. They're not the soldiers. You haven't got, you know, aristocrats and 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 trust fund babies who are going off on the front line. They're not the one. Even in Israel, they're not the ones who are, you know, killing these these Palestinian babies and whatnot. That's not them. No, it's the it's the have nots and the have little, the working classes. So, they obviously must have been tricked into thinking or must have been convinced into thinking that they're doing going into the service you know going to war and this that and the other is actually serving their interest or they might know that it's serving the interest of their overlords but they think that their interest of the overlords are in their best interest too For the, for the cooperation to be voluntary, the have-nots and the have-littles must believe that it would not be right or reasonable to take away what the have-plenties have. In other words, they must believe that for all its problems, the present social, political and economic order, with its disparities of wealth and power and privilege, is about the best that human beings can do. More specifically, the have-nots and the have-littles must believe that they are not being exploited by the have-plenties. Now, this seems to me to add up to an extremely plausible argument that, our, that ours is a social system that requires for its continued operation a set of beliefs necessary to secure the allegiance of the less well-off majority. These beliefs must be in some considerable degree false because the distribution of power, wealth and power in the United States is so obviously or so evidently arbitrary and unjust. Ergo, the need for ideology. Yeah. So page two, two, three. Now the ideology process. In addition to the special interest policy formation and candidate selection processes, the ideological process is crucially used by the powers that be to maintain and enhance their power over the masses. Domhoff discusses the ideology process thusly: the ideological, pro the ideal. The ideology process consists of the numerous methods through which members of the power elite 
attempt to shape the beliefs, attitudes, and opinions of the underlying population. It is within this process that the power elites elite tries to create, disseminate, and reinforce a set of attitudes and values that assure Americans that the United States is, for all its alleged defects, the best of all possible worlds. The ideology process is an adjunct to the other three processes, i.e. the policy formation process, the candidate selection process, and the special interest process, which we covered in the previous few chapters. The, ideolo the ideology process is an adjunct to the other three processes, for they would not be able to function smoothly without at least the resigned acquiescence of a great majority of the population. Free and open discussion are claims to be the hallmarks of the process, but past experience shows that its leaders will utilize deceit and violence in order to combat individuals or organizations which espouse attitudes and opinions that threaten the power and privilege of the ruling class. And we just have to say COINTELPRO, counterintelligence program. Google it if you don't know about COINTELPRO, and you'll learn all about what happened to the Black Power movement of the 1960s, the 70s, and 80s, and to this day, because a load of those a load of those warriors are still incarcerated to this time, or Mumia Abu Jamal and many others. And a bunch of them are dead, Fred Hampton. For example, Mark, Martin, Martin, Malcolm, the lot, Garvey, Marcus, Messiah, Garvey, in, in a way, was was uh, you know was taken down by the precursor of of, of the of COINTELPRO actually of, of the FBI. The ideology process is necessary because public opinion does not naturally and automatically agree with the opinions of the power elite. Without the ideology process, a vague and amorphous public opinion which often must be cajoled into accepting power elite policies, might turn into a hardened class consciousness that opposed the ruling class viewpoint at every turn. In order to prevent the development of attitudes and opinions contrary to the interests of the ruling class, leaders within the ideology process attempt to build upon and reinforce the underlying principles of the American system. Academically speaking, these underlying principles are called laissez-faire liberals, uh, laissez-faire liberalism. And they have enjoyed a near monopoly of a near monopoly of American political thought since at least the beginnings of the Republic. The principles emphasize individualism, free enterprise, competition, equality of opportunity, and a minimum of reliance upon government in carrying out the affairs of society. Yeah. And then Lao Tzu, shout out to you. Let's have a look here. Comment, comment from you, good brother. You said, here in the United States, a part of the ideology is the belief that the country is an indispensable nation, leader of the free world, defending freedom and democracy. Oh, absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. And it's it, obviously that came from that came from Britain mainly in in, in the first instance, because that's kind of how Britain views itself as well. America, the United States can at least you know, back up this claim with the ability that, that it has to go out and buck, wage these wars and, you know, topple, topple leaders it doesn't like and this, that and the other. Whereas Britain can't really do that independently anymore and hasn't really been able to do that independently for a, probably a good 70 years. Whereas the United States does have that ability. And you, it's, uh, I mean, recently there was that thing in, the, in Russia where, where some opposition leader was, was killed or died and you know I, was, I don't watch the news I don't read newspapers but I just happened to be in a shop and there were these new newspapers there and I saw I saw these headlines like uh, outrage at uh, death of whatever this guy's name was and outrage outrage and then uh, I looked at some of the front pages the Guardian the Times you know this that and the other and it was like yeah, leaders, you know, leaders around the world have, have expressed their disgust at this. And like, there's one quote from Mr. Biden saying something on the lines of, you know, nothing is off the table. We will do what we need to do. This cannot be allowed to happen. And you just think, this isn't your country, mate. This is some other country that you think you have the audacity to talk as if this is taking place in your own country. Do you know what I mean? It's not like, the, the Republicans went and like killed someone. No, this in America, 
oh, it, this isn't even affecting an American person. This is like in some other country, you think, Mr. Biden and others, that you you think you can go around saying, yeah, no, 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 uh, Putin, Putin can't be allowed to do this. We're gonna we're gonna have to do something about this. This is not right. You know, they talk. The West talks literally as if they are the policemen of the world, and as if they are the arbiters of moral pronouncements and moral discipline and, and so forth. And it's 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 funny to see actually. It's, it's it's shocking, but it also is kind of comical to 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 hear this kind of talk. And the good thing about this day and age in in comparison to maybe 20 years ago is that you have Russia, you have China, you know, you have uh, who, who are ro so-called rogues who are just saying Pointing out, you no, you don't control us. You can't control us. China can say, actually, we control you, fam. You know, you take us down. We're taking you down with us. Do you know what I mean? Because economically, you depend on us. So at least there's, it's a little bit easier to, to to see through this kind of this kind of nonsense talk. But back, you know, back in the days, after the Cold War finished, supposedly finished, it was there was a period of like five, ten years where it did seem that America and you know ch ch cheerleaders. The British cheerleaders could literally do whatever the heck they wanted, but I think, um, yeah. So, but you're, but you're, of course, you're right, Lao Tzu, that the, the this 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 mythology of America being like completely indispensable to the to the world affairs, healthy world affairs. Is, they almost see themselves as if themselves as if that the oxygen of the world without America, the world will basically collapse. The world system will collapse, and in a way, that is true, but only the world system being the world system that they have set up to serve their own interests. The Bretton Woods system, the UN, the, you know what I mean, NATO and all this kind of stuff. Yeah, in that sense, the, Amer the United States is absolutely essential to keep that going, but it's not, it's nothing to do with freedom and it's certainly nothing to do with democracy unless you define freedom and democracy in a very particular way that, um, that allows you to say that the American presidential system is democratic for example <laughs> so uh all right back to page 223 thank you for that my brother we're at the bottom of 223 going into page 224 the principal ideological goals of the ruling white male elite in america and the white and of the white american nation taken as a whole relative to its domination of the african american community are to legitimate and justify their support, superordinate position and power, generate the evidence that generate the evidence that, sub that substantiates their claims to power and legitimacy, have their rule and domination appear inevitable and natural, i.e. not the result of deliberate, perhaps malicious intentions on their part, gain the freely given, quote unquote, freely given consent of African-Americans to subordination, to white power and to constantly reproduce the conditions of, of African-American community dependency and relative powerlessness. The manufacturing of consent, it's a quote from uh, Noam Chomsky, the manufacturing of consent of the African-American community to its own subordination, i.e. the ideological indoctrination of the African-American community in such ways as to neutralize its capacity to realize its potential power to liberate itself from Euro-American domination is achieved not solely through the white ruling elite's ownership and control over all major ideological vehicles in the society. For example, the electronic media, print media, educational and socialization institutions and processes. The receptivity of the African-American community to white American ideological propaganda is chiefly the result of having been socially and mentally conditioned by the systematic control of its concrete living conditions by the white American nation. In other words, the white American nation controls the material conditions of the African-American nation. And that is the key thing. The media and ideology stuff is of course important, but it's actually controlling the living conditions of the African American nation, which is which is we're talking about here. The sustenance, control, and organization of American African American life by Euro Americans 
permits them to significantly shape the perceptions, experiences, capacities, expectations, and interests of African Americans so that justification for the rules of white power appear credible. Euro-American control of the African American historical and contemporary social and experiential context is such that it is extremely difficult for many African Americans to mentally position themselves outside that context so as to compare Euro-American propaganda and rules of power with alternative ideologies, specifically African ideologies, and rules of power and challenge their apparent plausibility and credibility. Absolutely. This is absolutely critical stuff that we are reading now. Shout out to everyone who's, who's joined. Make sure you like the video, please. Make sure you share. Uh, make sure you subscribe. And let's do this. Thus, we're at the bottom of page 224 here. Thus, as Beetham explains, the justifications advanced for a given system of power are vindicated by effects generated by the power system itself, but which are not understood as its effects because they appear autonomous or independent of it. As Marx himself understood well, though not all later Marxists have followed him or worked out the implications for other dimensions such as gender, it is the appearance of the socially constructed as natural that lies at the heart of all ideology. What is socially constructed is not itself imaginary or illusionary, and its evidence gives credibility to the justifications advanced for a given system of power. Yet the fact that it's, it is constructed indirectly by that same system of power is obscured by the complexity of the processes involved and by the fact that these processes such as, such as those of socialization are not necessarily managed by the powerful, but often by the subordinate themselves. Wowzers going deep there. So, so in other words, as, as Bobby Amos Wilson has said a few times already in this book, the, the results of the system, people don't, don't connect, for example, let's talk about black on black crime. That's the, you know, that's the, that's the thing that people will probably talk about. You know, you know these uh, black conservatives and whatnot. It's black on black crime, black people, or, or single unwed mothers, single parent families. People will look at that and say, you see, that's the cause of the black, the problems in the African-American community. But they don't know, or they, they are unwilling to uh, recognize that these manifestations, these phenomena, black on black crime, uh, single parent families, and so on and so forth, in as much as, you know, in as much as single parent families can be a negative thing, and, and that they can, particularly when you've got a large concentration of them, those things are created by the system itself in, in many different nefarious ways. But it's not as easy to be able to see the causal connection between the, the two things, because for one thing, a lot of people don't even think in terms of systems. They don't think in terms of there's a political system, there's, an, there's a particular organization of the resources in society and power that favors a particular group of people. People don't think in that way. They tend to just view everything that's happening around them in society as just happening. It's just happening. It's just there. It's, you know, it just so happens that you have these, you know, white, male, generally older people who control everything. It just so happens that that's the case. They control everything. It's just how it is. And it just so happens that most black people live in certain inner city areas, impoverished areas. It's just, just the way it is. It just so happens, you know, there's, there's there's no joining of the dots. They view, a lot of people view life in a very fragmented, atomized kind of way. And so they can't join the dots, join the dots together. And, and then that last point that Bob Amos Wilson made is really important as well, that a lot of the time, the processes that are involved, when you look at like the, 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 uh, the state's, the levers of state power that are involved or you know the the you see black people in there you see working class people in those seats and those positions and you think oh this there's no class issue here actually not understanding that the piper is calling the tune they can't they don't know who the piper is they can't see the piper there's pipers so page 225, the most effective means of disseminating and re reproducing ideas in society and in the African-American community in particular is to have that community perceive their dissemination and reproduction as the work 
of disinterested, unbiased, non-manipulative, liberal, yet authoritative, authoritative white American individuals, groups, or institutions, or as flowing from sources independent of the marked influence of the powerful. Thus, White America strongly pushes and projects the powerful mythology of independent, liberal American media, universities, and other information processing establishments. That is, America loudly congratulates itself for what it calls its free press and mass media, which permit the free exchange of ideas. Most are not mindful of the fact that the American press and mass media are privately owned, profit-making, white elite controlled corporations. The press is one among other institutions and one of the most important in maintaining the hegemony of the corporate class and the capitalist system itself, advances Parenti. And this next quote is from Michael Parenti, Inventing Reality, the Politics of Mass Media, 1986. If the press cannot mold of every opinion, it can frame the perpetual reality around which are opinions take shape. Here may lie the most important effect of the news media. They set the issue agenda for the rest of us, choosing what to emphasize and what to ignore or suppress. In fact, organizing our political world for us. The media may not always be able to tell us what to think, but they are strikingly, strikingly successful in telling us what to think about. <laughs> oh my goodness me, that's a brilliant quote. The media may not always be able to tell us what to think, but they are strikingly successful in telling us what to think about. Brilliant. So I, I made a comment earlier about the, the death of the, the political opposition leader in, in Russia. And that's front page new of the news, probably was leading on all the news stories and so forth. Why is that? Why is that the leading story? You know, this like, it's like Babylon, the ruling elites, whatever you want to call it, Urugu, wants you to be talking about and thinking about a certain few things. Now, as Michael Parenti just says there, there's 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 space for us to be thinking differently about these things, but the most important thing is that you're talking about these things. These are the things on your agenda. These are the things that are front and center in your mind, not Jackson, Mississippi. What's that got to do with anything? Well, Jackson, Mississippi is where cooperation, Jackson, uh, you know, led by... Uh, that's come out of a, a whole tradition of African-American cooperative economic grassroots democracy organizing of going back hundreds of years, actually, are attempting to build up a, 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 a grassroots participatory democracy and, and participatory economic system to provide a, an example for ways in which it might be possible to you know, destroy the system from within. But you've never heard of it. I mean, most of us have never heard of Cooperation Jackson. Most of us have never heard of that because why? It's not on BBC. It's not on CNN. It's not on Sky. It's not front page news on YouTube. It's not on Facebook. The algorithms aren't, algorithms aren't pushing that stuff, but they'll push a lot of this other nonsense. And where things are probably different, again, I, I wish Baba Amos Wilson had, was, was with us to lie, you know, in this realm now because I would love to hear his analysis of social media and the internet era. I would love to hear it because, because the, the facade of multi of plurality, the facade of oh, it's free, free democracy, it's free ideas and so forth. That facade, which was very evident in the 1990s and 80s, is even more evident now because because it looks more diverse now it looks more diverse with the inter internet era social media era it appears as though anyone can just go up and just say whatever they want everyone can but obviously the algorithms are making sure that you know a stream like this or some of these other things aren't going to be getting no hundreds of thousands of views you know whereas a stream on cnn will so uh, so there you go and then a comment here from from uh, brother lao tzu he said Thomas Sowell, yeah. Thomas Sowell, the African American economist, justifies capitalism and minimizing the effects of slavery and racism. Yeah, absolutely. We talk about Thomas Sowell uh, periodically on this uh, on this platform, and uh, you know he's a, he's a he's clearly a bright guy. He is like a broken clock because 
a, sometimes he does make he in amongst all of his just conservative talking points he does say some things which are very accurate and very very uh very an accurate depiction of reality but unfortunately the majority of the time his purpose has been to like you said there to 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 minimize the impact of these slavery jim crows and so forth and in particular to to place the blame for uh, what you might call dysfunction in african american com communities to put the blame at the foot of civil rights of the welfare state uh, of this that and the other and again there's, there's an element of truth in that but he's doing it to take attention away from his paymasters and his buddies you know who 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 actually are in control of everything it's a very da very dangerous guy that that thomas soul brilliant but dangerous brother so it is back to the quote here from uh, michael parenti it is enough that they create opinion visibility giving legitimacy to certain views and illegitimacy to others the media do the same to substantive issues that they do to candidates, raising some from oblivion and conferring legitimacy upon them while consigning others to limbo. This power to determine the issue agenda, the information flow and the parameters of political debate so that it extends from the ultra right no further than the moderate center is not total, that is, if not total, still totally awesome, that's <laughs> totally awesome. So good. He's a good Michael Parenti is a good guy. I remember Michael Parenti used to be quite there was quite a bit of him on the internet, like sort of five, ten years ago. I don't really see so much about him, but I think he's still alive, but he's just quiet these days. And then Lao Tzu said his disciple, this is Thomas Sowell's disciple, Sababu N. Plata, who completed the work. Oh, Baba Amos Wilson's disciple. Sababu N. Plata, who completed the work we are reading. Yeah, you you mentioned him before, didn't you? Didn't you, brother? Um, and uh, yeah, I think I think at some point soon it will, will, will be good to see if we can try and get him get him on on here because that'll be that'll be really powerful and really humbling for me as well. But I think I would like to probably maybe finish this book before I do that. One thing I'm thinking is that I might start doing these streams at around about this time. Um, you know, regularly, and the, de depending if it works for everybody, but what that would help me to do or enable me to do is to probably do them more frequently as well. So rather than rather than just having one a week, maybe like one or two a week, just some of the, the thought that just occurred to me. Because at this time of the day as well, you can see the sun shining, I'm getting that, you know, that not ultraviolet, but I'm getting that a bit of infrared and, and visible light that's energizing me and so forth. It's middle of the day rather than being right at the end of the day when it's been a long, hard day and then I'm sitting in front of a bright, bright screen that's bombarding me with blue light and, uh, you know, raising my cortisol levels and so forth. I definitely feel more alert and with it at this time of day. Just a random thought. But to... Uh, the so back to 225 bottom of page 225 going into page 226 the central aim of the ruling elite elite ideology process is to define the domain of discourse that is the corporate elite seeks to define the limits of acceptable ideas and to define what is worth talking about worth learning teaching promoting and writing about of course the limits of the acceptable, the responsible, are set at these points which support and justify the interests of the elite itself. To a great extent, the elite ideology process essentially involves the reinforce, reinforcement of long-held orthodox American, quote-unquote, values and perspectives, page 226, practices and ideals, which the system of power relations has already indirectly shaped to begin with. These factors are the ideological bases of elite power. It is a well-known fact that propaganda works best when used to reinforce an already existing notion or to establish a logical or emotional connection between a new idea and a social norm. Okay, that's interesting. So ideology, propaganda works best when used to enforce an idea that already exists or to connect a new idea can, uh, to create an, an emotional or logical connection with a new idea. Okay. It is important to note that many of these pre existing notions are the products of elite propaganda and conditioning processes, harking back to earlier historical eras, to socialization, 
experiences in the early childhood, adolescent and young adulthood years in the family, educational institutions, peer groups, and to media exposures during these impressionable years as well. This is something that that he talked about in a few, uh, earlier in the, in the in the book as well. Really important. Really interesting that. Right, so he's saying that a lot of the foundational concepts and ideas, which then have to keep being reinforced by propaganda, get embedded in our formative years. So it's when we're children that we first learn these ideas, which is why it's so important for me to read this book as a parent of young children myself now, which is why it's so important to guard the eyes and ears of these young children because if they take on these ideas now when they're four five six you know then later on in life they'll just you know it's like the raw materials will be there for babylon to just you know to bamboozle them and confuse them that's why one of the things i do as a parent i can't win unable to homeschool at the moment unwilling maybe uh, to do what's necessary to homeschool them but at the very least there's no there's no breakfast club. There's no after school club. As soon as school finishes, home with us. You know, we're not watching a whole bunch of TV, hardly any TV. The TV watch very, very carefully monitored uh, because, yeah, because, I, I, you know, I, I, don't want the, I don't want them to be like fully just completely open to everything that's out there until we've been able as parents to to set the foundation with regard to what life is, what 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 the point of life is, what 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 love is, what family means, what what community is, who they are, what their identity is, what being African means, what being black means, and so forth. I want to. We're going to set those first before you know, so that when they go out into the world now, they've got that kind of foundation. Just like their health, their physical bodies, their health systems, their immune systems, their brains have to be fully formed before, you know, they can go out and deal with all of the, the stresses and strains that come through, you know, life. Same goes with their ideological bodies, if you like, if that's a, if that's the thing. So, yeah. So these foundational concepts are laid early in impressionable years. OK, then back to the Baba Amos. The ideas, attitudes and response tendencies implanted by these early experiences are often mistakenly identified by their hosts as self-generated. Pre these previous selective exposures and experiences become the infrastructure which helps to maintain a later accrued selective attention tunnel vision orientation. This orientation serves to resist new ideas and practices not compatible with the old or pre-existing set of ideas and practices. This may be the case even when such pre-existing ideas or practices are not producing desired or satisfactory outcomes. Thus, through its monopoly of the media and the means of disseminating and validating information and interpreting reality, the ruling elite not only reinforces and channels its monopolies into simultaneously, to simultaneously, oh, I'm sorry, no, oh, sorry. The, the ruling elite not only reinforces and channels those orthodox values which support its supremacy, but also utilizes its monopolies to simultaneously prevent groups with a different ideology from presenting their interpretation of events. As Hirsch further contends, this is Glenn Hirsch from Only You Can Prevent Ideological Hegemony, written in 1975. In order to preserve ideological hegemony, it is only necessary for the ruling group to reinforce dominant values and at the same time, prevent the dissemination of opinion that effectively challenges the basic assumptions of, of the society. Public knowledge of inequality and injustice isn't so damaging as long as those percep perceptions are not drawn together into a coherent opposing ideology. Okay. Okay. Prevent the dissemination of opinion that effectively challenges the basic assumptions. All right. David Salak very aptly observes that the ruling elite achieves its ends when it prevents groups with opposing ideologies from attaining a value consensus through its attempts to, conf to create confusion, fragmentation, and demonstrate inconsistency in their belief systems, or 
as Domhoff argues, when it ensures that opposing opinions and values are only partially developed, remain isolated and are made suspect. This is page 227. Thus, as Domhoff summarizes, the elite ideology process and network is not the be all and end all of ruling class domination. It does not function to eliminate conflict, thereby maintaining the illusion of the free flow of ideas, freedom of speech, but to keep conflict from leading to an alternative ideology pro that provides the basis for an anti-corporate, anti-capitalist, and in brackets here, anti-white supremacy, social movement, unquote. So true, so important. Domhoff concludes his review of the processes of ruling class domination in America, which parallels and conditions the processes of white supremacy in America and the world, with the very important reminder that the struggle for power is a continuous one. The contradictions and tensions inherent in ruling class domination and in white global supremacy make domination vulnerable to a successful challenge from insurgent mass class and ethnic based movements. An appropriately innovative, united, well-organized political economic counterattack by such movements can take successful advantage of the economic or political conflicts and vulnerabilities now present in the white supremacist establishment or of its inevitable future contradictions and conflicts. Okay, so that's a there's a lot in there. That's a very dense point. I, the key thing that kind of probably jumped out of there was what, what he was talking about, what we were talking about earlier about the, the importance of the ruling elites to make sure that there's no joined up thinking that while you might get some left wing radical on page, you know, on page, uh, sorry, on page, I'm reading the comment, while you might get left wing or black radicals popping up on the news here and there and everywhere, you'll never, it will never be to the extent of to, to, to that you know, they're able to go on there and have like, I don't know, an hour long program on, on primetime TV, laying out the principles of Pan-Africanism, for example. You're never gonna get that. You're never gonna get a, a Garvey organization or, or, even, or even a Corporation Jackson or whatever, having, you know, a large chunk of time, not in a question, because one of the things they do as well, very successfully is that, you know, when they, they'll get a guest on and then they'll, they will ask them questions or they'll get them in a panel and they'll kind of browbeat these the, the radicals into a corner, gang up on them. Or if there's if there's a question and answer format, the questioner will just... Uh, Piers Morgan is excellent. He's, he's brilliant at this. He will railroad that conversation. He will channel that conversation into a direction that prevents any real, clear, coherent, systematic outlining of the ideology of the particular radical guest. But the fact that that person was on gives that kind of that facade of 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 openness. Oh, OK. Yeah, well, yeah there, there was a radical on there before, you know. So and I, I, I did really like what, what Bob Amos also said there toward the end, which is that. It is possible a, an appropriately innovative, united, well-organized political economic counterattack can be can be waged by by the oppressed. And, and, and that's that's. That's one of the things I really like about Baba Amos Wilson is that he is not a defeat, defeatist. He was not a defeatist. He was someone who was constantly appealing to us to realize that there are things that we can do, you know. And uh, and that's uh, and that's a, that's a real. <clears throat> that's we need more and more of that, more and more of that in this day and age. Shout out to you, Lao Tzu. Said so pages twenty. 226 and 227, which is what we've just written, and the fragmentation of the African-centered movement in the United States of America is worth investigating. Yeah, for sure. Absolutely sure. Okay, I th I think we will... Let me have a look. Yeah, let's read. We're going we're gonna to go up to... I'm going to go up to page 230. I think that's a that's a good place to uh, to pause, and then we'll do we'll do part two of chapter eleven. I'll try and get that get that in this week later on this week, maybe Wednesday, Wednesday or Thursday. Oh, um, yeah, maybe Wednesday. Oh gosh, the days are running out. I've got such a busy week, but we'll, I'll try and get that in at some point this week. Anyway, maybe tomorrow, actually. But here we go. The last last couple of pages we'll read today: media and ideology process. This is on page two two seven. 
Social institutions are the primary means by which a society def defines itself, its views, and the relationship to its world. This is the case whether we refer to a society's religious, family, education, scientific, economic, healthcare, political, or other social institutions. Social institutions structure and give meaning to a society's social thoughts, practices, and interactions. They regulate and socialize its members and provide the instrumental means by which the society instructs and polices itself, propagates and reinforces its dominant values, maintains and advances its dominant interests, generates social power and structures its internal and external power relations. <clears throat> Institutions in an oppressive society function to maintain its structural status quo. As Michael Parenti contends, quote, most American institutions, be they hospitals, museums, universities, businesses, banks, scientific laboratories, or mass media, are owned by a relatively small number of corporate rich. When trying to understand the context and purposes of the media, this pattern of ownership takes on special significance, unquote. In the context of ethnically pluralistic America, the latter part of the next to last sentence of Parenti's statement can be usefully transliterated to, quote, owned by the white American community, unquote. However, it remains true that within that community, the major institutions and in the context of our present focus, the mass media are owned by a relatively small number of the corporate rich. This is on page 228 now. Parenti proceeds to ask and answer the following question. And there's a, a long quote here. Who specifically owns the mass media in the United States? 10 business and financial corporations control the three major television and radio networks, NBC, CBS, and ABC. 34 subsidiary television stations, 201 cable TV stations, 62 radio stations, 20 record companies, 59 magazines, including Time and Newsweek, 58 newspapers, including the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Wall Street Journal, and the Los Angeles Times, 41 book publishers and various motion picture companies like Columbia Pictures and 20th Century Fox, three quarters of the major stockholders of ABC, CBS, and NBC are banks, such as Chase Manhattan, Morgan Guarantee Trust, Citibank, and the Bank of America. So I, I learned something the other day that apparently when when Haiti uh, defeated the Europeans got its you know got its freedom, and when the, when the French forced it to pay force Haiti to pay reparations, that those reparations were eventually the reparation bill was taken over by the Americans by Citibank, I believe. So they were the ones who were getting the money being paid over a hundred years by the Haitians. Uh, so yeah, anyway, just goes to show these companies that we read about now. They didn't come out of nowhere. They, they, they have got history with us as Africans. Dark, negative, bloody history. The overall pattern is one of increasing concentration of ownership and earnings. According to a 1982 Los Angeles Times survey, independent daily newspapers are being gobbled up by the chains at the rate of 50 or 60 a year. 10 newspaper chains earn over half of all newspaper revenues in this country. Five media conglomerates share 95% of the record and tapes market, with Warners and CBS alone controlling 65% of the market. Eight Hollywood studios account for 89% of US feature film rentals. Three television networks earn over two thirds of total US television revenues. Seven paperback publishers dominate the mass market for books. This is what we're reading about here is the consolidation of ownership, which is only, which just continued and continued. It's much, much more concentrated now than even it was 25 years ago. Of the existing independent television and radio shows, 80% are network affiliates. Practically the only shows that these independents produce are the local evening newscasts. The rest of their time being devoted to network programs. In other words, they just, they just, repeat the shows that are being produced by the mainstream ones. Most of the stations are affiliated with the public broadcasting system, PBS, which receives almost all its money from the federal government and from corporate donors and their founders with a smaller share for listener subscription, 
unquote. We must keep in mind that when Parenti presented these data in 1986, the ownership and control of the media, mass media, was still diffuse compared to its narrow manipulist, manipulistic, monopolistic ownership today. So Baba Amos Wilson was writing 10 years after Michael Parenti wrote, and here we are reading 25 years after Baba Amos wrote. Not only has traditional electronic and print media been far more consolidated under few, far fewer owners since then, but the communications revolution currently underway in the forms of information superhighways and giant national and international interactive media networks are the sources of furiously combative conflicts over their ownership and control by less than a handful of media and information processing conglomerates. The mass media and the information communication systems are the major tools for generating, maintaining and converting individual and public opinions into social power, power used to oppress and exploit. The white, the white corporate media information establishment uses its control of the mass media to create and reinforce the ideology that transforms its interest, its interest into a general interest justifying ex existing class relations as the only natural and workable ones, the, prefer the preferred and optimal, although not perfect, societal arrangement. The corporate elite owned and controlled media function to create a climate of opinion to shape social perception by framing the reality and information, which basically shapes the formation and expression of ideas, sorry, of opinions. They do this mainly through setting the issues agenda, that is, by controlling the domain of discourse, uh, for example, determining what is worthy of public exposure and discussion. They choose what issues and information are to be emphasised, to be ignored or suppressed. Consequently, they create visibility and legitimacy for certain persons, groups, and opinions, and thereby impose limits on public knowledge, interest, discourse, and understanding, behavioral orientation, and capability. These contentions can be solidly substantiated by an analysis, not only of the ownership and control of the mass media, but even more relevant of their general programmatic content. Page, just over a page left. And this is a quote from Parenti again. Conservatives and religious new rightists make over 17,000 weekly television and radio broadcasts around the country, with much of the airtime donated by sympathetic radio owners. Hundreds of radio and TV stations are owned outright by conservative organizations. Oh, this is interesting. Over 1,000 radio and TV outlets beam a fundamentalist evangelical message around the nation. Also, Africa, Central and South America, the Caribbean and the Pacific. Ain't that the truth? If you're wondering why evangelicalism is so popular in Africa right now as it is, look back to the 1980s and 90s when they started doing this sort of stuff, pumping, what's that, CBN, you know, and, and all these Christian fundamentalist, Zionist Christian uh, things being beamed to Africa from back then, shaping the minds of our African melanated uh, brothers and sisters and children. The right is not seeking changes of a kind that burden or threaten the interests of the dominant corporate class. If anything, it advocates a view of the world that wealthy media owners look upon with genuine sympathy, unlike the view offered by left protesters. The centrist media is, in a word, more receptive to the right than to the left because its owners and corporate heads share the, the right's basic feelings about free enterprise, capitalism, communism, labor unions, popular protest, and US global supremacy, even if not always seeing eye to eye with it on certain policies and certain cultural issues. In addition, the right has the money to buy media exposure and the left usually does not. Simple. All right, last two paragraphs now. Again, an updated version of what Parenti noted in 1986 will convincingly demonstrate the preponderance and pervasiveness of a general center-to-right political media establishment arrayed against Black America and progressive non-Black Americans. A review of the most popular TV and radio talk programs saliently reveals that they owe their popularity to barefaced and barely disguised anti-Black, anti-liberal, socio-political orientations and content. 
A review, uh, where are we? In a major urban market like New York City, hate radio, unadorned crude expressions of hatred of blacks are a 24 hours, seven day a week fair. The radio stations and hosts who broadcast such attitudes receive markedly higher ratings and are listened to by enormously larger audiences, numbering in the millions compared to their milder or even more liberal counterparts. Rush Limbaugh, Rush Limbaugh, nationally syndicated TV and radio personality who transparently disguises his Reaganite, cons uh, Reaganite conservative views, anti-black, anti-liberal attitudes as entertainment and political satire, speaks daily to an audience approaching 20 million, 70% of whom are middle to lower class whites. His first book sold over 3 million and his second, published in the fall of 1993, had a first printing of 3 million, the largest in US history. Limbaugh's blustery, vacuous rantings laced with cliched conservative ideo ideologies earned him not only a, his large national audience as well as audiences with conservative US presidents and high administration officials, but an estimated four million US dollars from radio annually, goodness me. Sales from his first book grossed over eight million US dollars and his 12 page monthly newsletter supported by, by some 370,000 subscribers grosses 11 million dollars, goodness me. These earnings pushed Limbaugh's income in, in the area of 20 million dollars for 1993. Anti-black propaganda, conservative ideological publications not only help maintain the white supremacist status quo, but to put the icing on the cake are the sources of fabulous wealth, fame and prestige. And there we have it. Thank you very much, everybody. We have Baba Amos Wilson has schooled us once again. And um, yeah, really, really good first half of the chapter. We're going to carry on with the second half of that chapter. I'm going to try and do it later on this week. Um, shout out to everyone who's joined. Shout out to, to you, Lao Tzu. Always good to have you reasoning and, and bouncing ideas off. And uh, thank you. It's a gr um, great way to start the morning. Absolutely. Yeah. So good. I'm glad that worked for worked for you. And yeah, we'll be back. We'll be back again. Like I said, ho uh, hopefully later on this week. Stay tuned for that. Make sure you subscribe if you haven't already subscribed. And if you would like to support as well, you can become a patron or, or join our Substack. Links in the comment. So for now, I'm going to get back to work. Take care and I'll see you soon. Salama kwaherini. Peace.